Good evening and welcome to Close Up. We are counting down the historic 2014 elections on 17th September. And tonight we have on the show someone who is no stranger to elections, but who may not stand in the next elections. Although he remains the main campaigner for his political party, former Prime Minister and Labour Party leader Mahendra Chaudhary, welcome to Close Up. Thank you, Stanley, and a very good evening to all the viewers. Uh, it's good to have you back after eight years. Now let's, uh, let's look at your political career. Let's start by looking at your political career over the last 15 years. You won a landslide victory in the 1999 elections. You were taken hostage in parliament and your government overthrown in the 2000 coup. You lost the 2001 and 2006 elections. You became fi minister, f a finance minister in the interim government after the military took over in 2000 and 2006. You were then uh, uh, taken out and kept out of politics for a few years, given the emergency decree. Now you've been convicted for violating exchange, the country's exchange rate laws, and you may not stand in the, in the September election. So how would you describe your political journey over the last decade and a half? Because your critic says you've fallen from grace. Well, just who are these critics, Stanley? And what else would you want to expect from one's critics? They would not say anything complimentary about uh, someone uh, they don't like. And of course, I understand that uh, these critics are from uh, the opposition political parties to Labour. Uh, we, we will not be distracted by such criticisms. Uh, these criticisms uh, are uh, the usual thing in, in any election. And uh, it happened to us in 1999. People said a lot of things about Labour. Uh, we were written off by the media as well. But then when the people spoke out, it was a different story. And uh, we are expecting the same sort of results this time around. As far as uh, the question of my standing or not standing is concerned, I'm awaiting the appeal court's decision. We have a very good case. And uh, let's hope that uh, if I win, uh, I will be able to stand again. All right. Now, the, the, we will not discuss that. It's, it's before the court now. But how do you see the Fiji Labour Party's chances in the next elections? Because... Uh, and again, you know who they are. Many, many of your critics are saying you're no longer the force you once was. I'd leave that to the people to decide. I think on the 17th of September when they go to polls and when the results are delivered, let's wait until then and uh, then we will see uh, what happens. Because, I mean, uh, the, the political parties are saying, look, Mahendra Chaudhary is going around campaign. He's no longer getting the numbers he used to have in his... Um in his uh, campaign campaign meetings and things, and, and we do see that uh, a lot of the journalists that reports have come through. Your, your, your numbers are not the same as the other political parties. That is not correct. We have a different campaign strategy. We organize spo uh, small pocket meetings, and we go to where the people are. So you don't expect uh, a, a large gathering uh, in such meetings. But we're satisfied with the attendance we're getting. And uh, we hope to continue this way. Whilst we are there, we are also organizing our polling station committees. There's a lot of organizational work that needs to be done because this is completely a different system to what our people are used to or were used to under the previous elections. So we have to uh, reformate a lot of things so that uh, on the voting day, because it's going to be one day election, we have maximum uh, 10 out of our supporters. So, so it's a matter of strategy. It's not, uh, it's not the way the people are reacting to you. You think it's, it's a deliberate strategy by the Labour Party? It is, but the other thing you must remember, Stanley, is that uh, for almost 80 years, no political activity was allowed. And people were intimidated. Uh, they were targeted. So uh, the crowd that you get now in opposition parties' meetings would be small. They start that way. But then let, we've still got five weeks or six weeks to go, and things will change. We are very happy with the response we're getting. And uh, when the results come out, I think people will... Uh, in these last eight years, have you been touched, in touch with your electorate? Absolutely. We have been functioning as a party, <coughs> and our, uh, our um, uh, structures have been... Uh, there all the time. Our offices have been open. In fact, we were the only political party functioning during the uh, public emergency regulations. With your own website and things. Everything. Uh, now. But, but the word going around, why I asked it, the word going around is that many say the FLP has lost what many regard as your base in the cane belt, so to speak. And then the second thing about that uh, is, is that you're divided. One, that you've lost your, your, your base in the cane belt. Second, the FLP has decided you've got um, even your son, Rajendra Chaudhary, on Facebook from Australia, questioning the, the candidates for your upcoming elections. 
You've got your former colleagues like uh, Felix Anthony and co. They've moved on to form another political party. So um, the Labour Party has taken a battering, some would say. I wouldn't say it, 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 I don't say that it, we have taken a battering. I think uh, there have been these developments. Of course, it has uh, affected us. But at the same time, it has not distracted us from doing what uh, we have to do for the people, from reaching out to the people, from building a uh, uh, new support base. And I'm very happy with the support that the Labour Party is getting today from the indigenous community. It, it's very heartening. And I think our you know, long uh, amb ambition in this area has, uh, is being fulfilled because the purpose of the Labour Party was to unite the two communities and, and, and that to see greater political integration between the communities. And I think we're achieving that, and I'm very happy with that. So your support still intact? You still, you still represent a strong, uh, st a strong number in the community. Yes, I would think so. Yes, indeed. All right, you're watching Close Up. Don't go away. We'll be right back after the break. Welcome back to Close Up. We're with uh, Labour Party leader Mahendra Chowdhury. Now, uh, we'll just continue a bit about the, the, the Labour Party and we'll just touch on a few other criticisms that have been made about the party, <laughs> party over the years. I mean, Are we going to talk about just the criticisms? We, we will, we we will, we will, we will come to the other issues well. after that. Let, let, let me give you a chance to respond to what people have been saying about you. You've, been, right, you've talked okay. about the media being unfair to you. Now is your chance for you to respond to things. One is that the Labour Party revolves, and that is one of the reasons why uh, Felix and co. have also left, that the Labour Party has revolved around, around Mahendra Chowdhury. And the word is that if Mahendra Chowdhury goes down, the Labour Party goes down. Well, Stanley, all political parties revolve around their leaders. It's the leadership which, is, which has the responsibility to um, carry the party. And it's the same with all political parties. It must have a strong leader, and only then will a political party succeed. You look at Fiji first, minus Kayum, and Bainimarama, there's nothing else. They have no base. And similarly, other political parties too. So, you know, when, uh, when it's a question of leadership, I think that's what it is. And if leadership is not performing, then it will be the people themselves or the party members who will change the leadership. So if Mahendra Chaudhary leaves, who will take over the Labour Party? It will be for the members to decide. We have a very democratic constitution and which uh, provides for election of leadership as well. So the, it will be the National Council and the Delegates Conference who will decide who the new leader will be. Questions uh, were raised. You've been seen by many as a champion for the poor for many years. I mean, it's defined your political career. People were quite surprised uh, uh, and questions were raised. This is not something new about the wealth that you have when you uh, stated your assets. What do you say to those who, who question how, uh, how genuine your message is when you've, uh, and, and question how you have achieved that wealth? Well, the matter is before the courts. Mm. There's no dispute about where that wealth came from. And uh, I think uh, it was not stolen from anybody. It was not stolen from the taxpayer. And uh, the money is clean. Even the courts have uh, so admitted. So where does the question arise that I have been dishonest with the people? I have not cheated on my salary. I have not cheated otherwise. I have not stolen from the taxpayer, not a single cent. So where is this question about honesty or dishonesty from coming from? It's, it's been stated, and we'll, we'll come now, we, uh, we'll talk about the others, because you have also questioned about the wealth of other politicians. You've stated, the Labour Party has stated that you still want full disclosure on the salaries uh, paid to, uh, the Prime Minister. to the Prime Minister. Indeed, yes. What do you say about that? Yes, why is the Prime Minister not, come, not fronting up? But he has fronted up. No, he, he has not fronted up. He is, he's telling us what he's getting now. I have challenged him many times, not just once, to disclose his salary from April 2010 and also disclose who was paying that salary and give the country audited accounts of uh, the salary payment from April 2010 right up to now. Uh, what is and he has consistently declined to do that, refused to do that. He's dodging the issue. He has not come out openly. The only way in which this particular issue can be Settled for once and for all is for the Prime Minister to produce those records. And because initially, you, uh, the FLP and other political parties, you had made some, put out some figures of what you thought they were getting. 
And then when the declaration came out, it was far way lower than what you guys were projecting. Indeed. Was the, was, was what? So, you, so you, you, it found out that you were not correct. No. We found out that the Prime Minister was not telling the truth. And this can only be, the truth can only be established by these accounts being produced. If they don't do it, it confirms that they were getting salaries around a million dollars each, Kayum and the Prime Minister. All right, we cannot confirm that right now, but let's come to the, the ironic thing about your criticism about the Mbaini Muramu government is that you were initially part of it for at least two years or a year and a half. And uh, Mbaini Muramu even praised you at one time as, as, as some kind of Robin Hood. Uh, he was quoted in the media saying, but then you've parted ways. Uh, what do you regret joining that interim government after the takeover in 2006? Because you received a lot of criticism <coughs> for it, even now. It's not a question of regret. At that time, the country needed my services, and I was approached by the then president, Ratu Josefa Iloilo, and I uh, took up the position at his request because the state finances were in very dire straits at the time, the economy was not doing well, and the president felt that uh, I had the necessary talent to stabilize state finances, so I took up the challenge. You did but prepare the first budget uh, for that government? I did, yes. yes. We revised the Garase budget, uh, and uh, I also prepared the second budget. And uh, we had, by the, by the time I left, the state finances had been stabilized. And I left uh, Stanley because the Prime Minister had written to all the cabinet ministers, this was around June, uh, of 2008 that those who were wishing to contest the elections in 2009 because at that time elections were to be held in 2009 uh, would have to resign from cabinet at least six months before you stood in the election, the election. yes yes no. there was another version though that the others are saying is that you were pushed out uh, well whatever this is, is documented version we've got letters to prove that that they wrote to all the ministers in cabinet then uh, that uh, if they were going to contest the elections, they must resign at least six months before uh, the elections. And so I left in, uh, towards the end of August uh, to prepare for elections which to be scheduled in April. I had my differences with the Prime Minister uh, in Cabinet. Uh, every uh, Cabinet will have uh, uh, such uh, incidents, but uh, overall I think uh, we've, we worked well until uh, until such time as uh, uh, the Fiji water saga came up. Uh, you'll recollect yes. that uh, there was a tax, excise tax, which uh, a cabinet agreed to. This tax was imposed, and then later on, uh, the, um, uh, some people in cabinet prevailed on the prime minister to uh, back off. Right. So since then, your, your differences mm. have, have widened. Mm. And, and uh, let me finish, let yeah. me finish. And then, ironically, the same tax was implemented a year later. And uh, so that was one. I think uh, there was a powerful uh, lobby uh, by Fiji Water or, or whoever, and they managed to get that tax off, but then they, they're now paying that tax. Uh, the second issue was over the, over the elections. Right. Uh, when it, it became a little uh, uh, obvious as, uh, uh, as time was going on that uh, elections may not be held in 2009, that we were going through uh, you know, a, 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 a facade of calling elections, okay. but in fact, uh, elections would not be uh, would not be held. So uh, these were some of the differences we had. Yes, and, and as I've said, your differences have now widened. Yes, indeed. You now think that that government was uh, was a mistake. You say you're not regretting it. No, if if Prime Minister Bani Marama had stuck to the promises he made to the people at the time of takeover, things would have been fine. But he didn't do that. He broke every promise he made. He said he will uphold the Constitution. He didn't do that. He abrogated the Constitution. Mm. He said he will take only one salary, and that of the commander's salary, and not the prime minister's salary. He broke that promise. He didn't. Uh, he took uh, the prime minister's salary, and we've already talked about salary. We've talked about it. Now then, I just a moment, let me finish. Yeah. And then he said that no one from the military would benefit from this coup. And we all know what the real story is. They've all benefited. All senior officers of the military have benefited from this coup. In fact, they're the biggest beneficiaries of the coup. And as I said, had he stuck to what he promised to the people, things would have been all right. If elections were held in 2009, as he promised, things would have been all right. But then he was consumed by power. He was consumed by greed. 
and therefore things change, and this is where I think the differences have widened. All right, your differences have widened, and widened, and uh, it, the response of uh, the military, his officers have benefited. He has other the version where he says that they had to do it. They well, didn't uh, when, when he comes, you ask him that. I will ask this him is my version. Then. Now, your, while your differences have widened with him, you've um, you've become going to a coalition with your former, someone who you had strong differences with, with now with the Sodelpa, with Lysen Yangarase. Uh, what, what, what's, what's to make with that, of that coalition? Because Bani Maram has called it a coalition of hypocrites. Well, he can say, old politicians. He can say anything. He has, a, he has a habit of pointing, accusing fingers at others without looking at his own record. That's what Mr. Bani Maram must do first. Look at himself in the mirror and then <laughs> now cast aspersions and condemnation at others. He needs to learn this in politics. Now, uh, as <laughs> far right. as the coalition is concerned, it is a proposed coalition. It's a post-election coalition. And let me tell you that for long it has been my ambition to see the two major races united in the country. For far long we have been kept apart by vested interests. Right? Now, when is that opportunity going to come when we will understand each other better? When we will unite our forces so that we can deliver to the people of this but country. But you can't, can't unite. I mean, uh, just, just, just this week, uh, Bani Maram has made some questions about race relations that you've just condemned. So, is it a marriage of convenience? No, 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 it's not. It's not. You did not These condemn are policies. The These are policies which are subject to negotiation. And as leaders, as responsible leaders, we owe it to the nation to sit down together and sort out our policy differences for the good of the country. This is something Bani Maram doesn't understand. He, you know, is used to the military type of administration. Give orders and expect people to, <laughs> to right. obey. We, we, are, we are different. We have to sit down. P people have differences. Political parties will have differences. Individuals have differences. Now, these differences can only be sorted out by sitting down together and looking at the bigger course. The bigger course is that of national unity, of putting the two races together, and 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 moving forward. We've had, we've got. All right, you Mr. Know, Chaudhry, I've been asked to go to the break. We will hold that thought. Yes. We will not go away. You're All watching right. Close Up. We'll be back after the break. Welcome back to, to Close Up. Now, uh, we were talking about your coalition with the Sodelpa, because Mbani Maram has said it's a marriage of convenience, a coalition of hypocrites. This is what he says about you. Chowdhury is well known for his chameleon behavior, simply to stay in power at all costs. He is in bed with the very people he accused of being racist and corrupt a few years ago. I have explained there is a change of leadership in Sodelpa. But the fact is that we cannot live in the past. Things have changed. We've got to look to the future. And this is exactly what we are doing. It has been my long time ambition, as I said to see the two races unite, because that is the only way in which Fiji can make real progress. We've got to learn to trust each other, and to live with each other, and understand each other. Funny and enough, Bani Marama has the same vision. He says that he is there to make the two nations, to the two races work together, and that he's succeeding in that regard through Fiji first. I don't think he's succeeding at all. My visits throughout the country have, have uh, told me one thing very conclus conclusively, that Bani Marama doesn't enjoy the support of the indigenous community. They dislike him for what he has done to them, and I think this is common but knowledge. But he is not here to represent, what he's here, he's no. not here to represent one ethnic, he's here to represent every Yes, ethnic but you group. cannot do good to the country by alienating the major, majority community altogether, by hurting their feelings, by hurting their uh, traditional and cultural values. And this is what exactly has happened. So, we want to get closer together as, majority com as uh, major communities in the country. And I think this is a very good opportunity. We must leave the past behind, look to the future. The past differences must be put on the table to see how we can sort this out for the good of the people. At the end of the day, it's the people who matter, not the leaders, not those who want to stay in power. And if there's anybody today who wants to stay permanently in power, it's Bani Marama and nobody else. So this coalition, let's just put in a, is not a coalition just to remove the Bani Marama government? That is one of the aims, because until we remove him, this country will not progress. So we're willing to... Uh, uh, but then, the, the, the bigger cause 
is to get the communities together because then we'll have permanent peace, we will have stability, and I think that is the way. So you're willing to put aside your differences just to remove this government you think is the key? Yes, and, and not only put aside our differences, mind you, but we, we are, we are we're going to reconcile those differences. They have to be done to, put, uh, to unite the people. And, uh, and I think it is possible. If we make a genuine and real effort to do that, we can do it. All right, so in a, nut uh, in a nutshell, what should be the issues that should decide these elections? Well, I think it's the issue of reclaiming our freedoms. People have lost their freedoms, their rights. Workers have the lost their rights and uh, the rights of the trade unions. There is uh, uh, escalating poverty, unemployment, high cost of living, housing for the poor, questions of accountability and transparency in, in governance. There are so many issues, uh, Stanley, which, which, uh, which must decide this, uh, this election. Now, what is happening actually is that Bani Marama and is trying to take away the real focus that should be on this election by uh, hurling accusations and aspersions. Now, that is not the uh, election. That is not the election issue. The issues are unemployment, high cost of living, poverty, housing, these things. And all these issues, Bani Marama has failed to deliver. The, uh, now, that's not what uh, a lot of people, a lot of people have argued. He's delivered on a few things. His infrastructure development, the roads have come through, free education has come through. I mean, a lot of, a lot of the supporters of Fiji First say they're supporting them because they've delivered much better than any other elected government in history. I disagree. I think he's, he's divided the nation. The roads he's building is, is through, uh, through loans, and, and these loans are suspect because the terms on which these loans have been given to Fiji, it's a big burden around our neck. The real truth will come out. If you if had given me more time, I would have told you about that. But maybe some other time I can tell you how these loans are structured and how, the, how we're going to pay through our So he knowledge. should not have taken those loans? No, he shouldn't have taken those loans on those terms. That if we don't have any control on that expenditure, you, you look at the Drakethi to Nambawalu Road, that's going to cost us almost $300 million. That's, you know, a road of merely 56 or 60 kilometers. Now that's three to four times of what it should really be costing. We have no control over the project cost under the terms of these loans. These loans are given to us in, in Chinese currency. We have to pay that back in the U.S. currency. But don't you agree those roads should be built, should be made? They should be built, but that we could have financed them otherwise without it being a burden around our neck. Right. A lot of people don't know about these things. Because this is why they didn't want information to go through. This is why there is media censorship in this country. Because the administration here doesn't want the people to know the truth. And once the truth comes out, people will understand. On your free education, why did it have to come in the seventh year? If we had been allowed to stay in power in 2000, we'd have delivered all this in 2003. It's coming 40 years. Delivered free education? Yes, by 2003. We'd already uh, done that for Forms 3 and 4 and Form 7. Fives and six were left, and by 2003 we would have done that, but we are not allowed to stay. So, this is coming, you know, 11 years too late, and all, that too at the end of his term. Why didn't it come in the fifth or fourth or fifth, sixth year? This is all a vote buying thing. All right, Mr. Charu, we have it's not censorship. We've got to, just a few. I have been told to ask you my last question now. Mm -hmm. Your manifesto is out. You put out manifestos in 2000 and. Uh, uh, one in 2006 and both manifestos yeah. you could not win the elections. What makes you think this will be different this time? In 1999, with, with our 99 manifesto, we won a landslide victory. Right? The fundamentals of that manifesto are in here. It's a people's manifesto. And our manifesto in 99 was praised by Ratu Sirkamise Samara as the best manifesto. With his 2014, yes, 2014. on the next elections. But as I said, that the fundamentals of the 99 manifesto are here. It's a people's manifesto. It effectively addresses the challenges that face the nation and the people. You know, when half the nation goes to, goes to bed hungry, when there is such unemployment that one out of every f f five youth don't have a job, when poverty levels have risen under Garase from 32% to 45% under Bani Marama. What have we achieved? What have we achieved? What has Bani Marama achieved? Nothing. It's the people. Right? Anybody can build roads with borrowed money. Right? I've told right. you about the terms of that money. Okay. And maybe we'll, we'll, I'll be invited back.
to, will, to, to give people we more will, information. We will hopefully get you back and we'll hopefully get uh, also the other political parties back. But uh, former Prime Minister and Labour Party leader Mahendra Charvi, thank you for joining me on Close Up. Thank you, Stan. Thank you. <coughs> that was the uh, Close Up for the evening. We'll be back next Sunday, 6.30. See you then. Good night.